Hey guys, it's Allie. Welcome back to Infertile Life, the podcast. This is episode 166 called Make Claire. Hello, everybody. This is Allie and Blair, the co-founders of Fertility Rally. And we are here to tell you a little bit about who we are, what we do, and how we can support you on your infertility journey. So we wanted to let you know that Fertility Rally is the membership group that we created. It's the place we wish we had when we were in the thick of it. We offer support groups. We have private Facebook groups. We have tons of events, lots of videos, blog posts, so much content. We're starting to do IRL events as well. And we want to be there for you no matter where you are on your journey. Yeah, our favorite part, we had no idea where this would go when we started it. And our favorite part about it is watching all of our members, which is like 300 plus at this point, connect and create true lifelong friendships. We have members that are meeting up in real life. We have members that are supporting each other on Instagram. We have members that call each other best friends now. And honestly, like that is the most rewarding thing to see. We had no idea it would go here. And so we're just... We're inviting you to join the Rally Fam. Yeah, it's such a great space. It's a safe space. We also have fun when we can. So we would love for you to be a part of it. Check us out on fertilityrally.com and on Instagram at Fertility Rally. Hope to see you guys soon. Today's episode is presented by Belly. Belly offers modern prenatal vitamins optimized for fertility, prenatal, and post-pregnancy health. To learn more about how to optimize your fertility and pregnancy health, check out their vegan-friendly, dairy-free, non-GMO vitamins for both men and women at bellybaby.com. That's spelled B-E-L-I-B-A-B-Y.com. The best part, if you use code Allie15, you'll get 15% off your first month of either belly women or belly men. Again, that's code Allie15, A-L-I-1-5 for 15% off. Thanks, Belly. All right, guys. So today I am talking to a dear friend of mine who I've really gotten to know very well over the last couple of years. Her name is May Claire Smith. She is the author of Prequel to Parenthood, and she is going to tell us today about going through IVF in her 40s. And she also has a really interesting story about how they got to their baby son, Isaac, who is so freaking amazing and cute and using a day seven embryo to have him. So she's going to tell us all about her journey, how they got to that point. It's not a very common thing for people to use a day seven embryo. So it's really interesting to hear what she went through. In fact, at one point she says, you know, so many clinics would have thrown him in the garbage. They never would have even let him have a chance to grow. So give it a listen, keep your mind open about embryos and the days and all that stuff. I want to thank May Claire and I want to thank Greg and I hope to meet Isaac someday very soon. Without further ado, this is May Claire's infertility story. May Claire. Oh my gosh. I, okay. I don't even know where to begin with you. (laughs) First of all, you, we like met through, I know you emailed me a long time ago and then we started like Instagramming, DMing. Then you were the very first member of fertility rally when we launched in June, 2020. And I will never forget that. And I will always be grateful that you took a chance on us and became member OG number one. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, and I just love you and I love your husband and I don't <laughs> want to do a spoiler yet, but I love your whole family. You guys are just the greatest. So thank you for doing oh, this. No, thank you. I, yes. I look back at how you were the podcast that got me through so much Yee. so early on. And I remember when I first met you, you were like this celebrity to me. And oh, please. Now you're, and, <laughs> and now you're my best friend. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny how um, it's everything. so wild. It's so yeah. wild. I love, oh. I mean, it's crazy how we talk about this a bunch, but just people you meet through social media, especially in this community, yeah. the bonds are immediate and they're strong Yeah, and they're like yeah. lifelong. Yeah. I mean, some of my some very, of my very best friends, friends yes. are, yeah. I met through Instagram and you know, it's just, it's so cool. So I'm so glad we all have this community to lean on each other, but let's start with you and your husband. Where did you guys okay. meet? 
We met on Match.com or Love Match, it. I guess it's called now Match.com back in the day uh, when online dating was on computers, not on cell phones. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so it was like finding a needle in a haystack. But I came across this profile of this guy holding a guitar that called himself equal parts a computer nerd, musician, and athlete. And I'm like, that's Hot. not true. That's totally true. It's totally who he is. Yeah. Oh my God. Had this awesome smile and I met him and we went out. I still remember our first date. We met at this little kind of hipster cafe for brunch on a Saturday and he walked down the street to me and he smiled and I'm like, oh God, like he just (laughs) So freaking cute. He does have such a good smile. And there's been many fertility rally calls and happy hours that he's come (laughs) on and played guitar. We're like, cry, come play. (laughs) Yeah. Claim to fame. So, but yeah. So, and we, I knew by, actually it's really funny. So after our first date, he said to me that he remembers me walking to my car and he thought I'm never going to see her again. And I'm like, why would you say that? Like we had this epic, like six hour first date. But yeah, I just, we really hit it off. And I think we both kind of thought it was maybe too good to be true. Uh Um, But by our third date, I knew like this was it. And we were pretty much inseparable ever since then. So love it. Yeah. So So when did, when did family come into the conversation? I think so. I was very much of the mindset. I didn't necessarily know I wanted children. Um, for a long time, actually, in my online dating years, it one of the questions was, do you want children? And it, I started out by saying no. And then I kind of evolved that to, well, maybe someday. And he and I talked about it at one point and he's like, yeah, you know, I think I'd like to have children. And, and I was like, yeah, I, you know, maybe if it happens. And, and I even remember saying to him very early when we were dating, I'm like, it's kind of like if it's meant to be and if it happens. And like, I have some friends that have gone through extensive fertility treatment. And I'm like, it's just so hard on your body and it's so expensive. I'm like, I would never do that. I, you know, it's just kind of, if it's meant to be, we may have children. So that's Mm -hmm. kind of where it started. It's clearly not where it ended. And then as we, you know, got closer in our relationship. So we, we met in 2015 and we got engaged in 2017. And by the time we were engaged, like we already had names picked out for our children. Like we Mm -hmm. knew, we knew we were going to have children. I, I knew I wanted his child. Like that's what, that's what did it for me. Everybody Mm -hmm. always said to me, they're like, it'll change when you meet somebody. And I'm like, no, it won't. I'm, I'm not having children. Like I was very focused on my career and traveling and doing all these things and, and having, I have two amazing nieces. And to me, that was enough until Mm -hmm. I met Greg. Mm -hmm. And then I really wanted a little version of him. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what changed it all for me. And then, yeah. So we got married in 2018. And in this epic, amazing, got married in French Polynesia in Bora oh my Bora God. Yep. and had this like amazing honeymoon. And while we were on our honeymoon, we decided that, okay, we're going to start trying as soon as we get home. And Greg was like, you know, I think we could wait a year. Like we don't need to jump into this. And I'm like, no, we can't wait because we're old and mm-hmm. we need How to get going guys? on this. 41 and 47 at the okay. time. So I was I was 41 and mm-hmm. I I knew I just had this feeling it was going to take time. Mm-hmm. So we got home from our honeymoon and we I had an IUD at the time and I went to my doctor, she took it out and I'm like, "Okay." And she's like, "Well, give it a go for about 6 months and if it doesn't work, then come back and we'll do something." Mm-hmm. And I was pregnant in 6 weeks. Mm-hmm. So it just shocked me that yeah. I got pregnant so quickly. Right. And I'm like, well, apparently this is going to be easy. Yeah. You're like nailed and, it. Yeah. And we like, I was actually worried that Greg wasn't going to be ready because it happened so quickly, but he was like just so ready so quickly. And he's like, I'm already in college. Like he's, he's all ready for this child to be here. And everything was great. We bought our first house. We were just sailing through Mm -hmm. Greg said we had this epic Q1 of our marriage the first three months Q1 (laughs) we had is he in finance (laughs) he's not but we we had this amazing wedding and all these wedding celebrations and this amazing honeymoon and we bought a house and we got pregnant and like everything was just we were just right it's all lining up 
it's all lining up. Everything's right. happening the way it's supposed to. And then it was actually the day before we moved into our new house. I was 11 weeks, five days pregnant and uh-huh. I started spotting. Okay. And, and what I, was your thought when you saw the, that? I immediately freaked out. And then I called the doctor, the nurse's line, and they're like, oh, well, this could be common. Like, just put your feet up and let's see when we can get you in. And and they really kind of tried to downplay it. They're like, you know, you're almost 12 weeks. I'm sure everything is fine. Like, mm-hmm. just, just take it easy. And we got in and I remember the ultrasound and they, they did this ultrasound and I'm like, and it, it looked like a baby as opposed mm-hmm. to the first ultrasound we had. It looked like a little bean and you didn't see very much. Right. And had you heard the I, heartbeat and stuff before? We had, point? yeah, okay. we had. So we okay. had, had our first ultrasound mm-hmm. at about, I guess about eight weeks and, okay. and we heard the heartbeat and everything seemed to be progressing. And then I remember that ultrasound and you know, I, was relieved at first because I'm like, okay, look, it looks like a baby. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, oh, but there's no heartbeat. And then I I instantly knew. And the doctor was very quiet. And you know when the doctor is quiet that yep. it's not good news. Yeah. So that then really surprised us. I, at yeah. the time, so we knew sad. very little about miscarriage mm-hmm. and how common it was. And I had absolutely no idea what was going to happen next. Mm-hmm. And I, I can't even remember what the doctor told me. I, I do remember her saying that, you know, this this may pass on its own. And that's the words they use. It may pass on its own. Mm-hmm. Or if not, we could schedule a procedure, a DNC. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what do you want to do? And I, my brain isn't functioning. Like right. I'm just crying. I'm so yeah. sad. Like we just, this perfect world that we just had has come crashing down. Yeah. So we went home and she's like, you know, this, it may be starting that maybe the spotting that you're having. So we went home that night and I, it was the day before we were moving and Greg had been doing a certification exam. So he had been up the whole night before he hadn't slept and we were moving the next day. And I just remember we went home and he crashed on the couch and I went upstairs and I had a bath. And as soon as I got out of the bath, I just started having this um, intense crap cramping. Yeah. And I just started bleeding uncontrollably. And I remember sitting on the toilet and blood just gushing out of me. And it was terrifying. Yeah. And I I didn't know at the time, but I I was cramping so much because I was in labor and I was essentially delivering this 12 week baby. Right. And I was bleeding so much and I, I didn't know what was normal. And you go to Google and you read and you don't know what to do. And I call a doctor and you know, Greg said to me a couple of times, he's like, do you want me to take you to the emergency room? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I I think this is normal. I think this is what happens. Right. And it just got to the point that I had lost so much blood that I'm like, I think we need to go to the emergency room. So he took me to emergency and that was a horrible experience because I got there and you have to check in and I'm checking in and they're like, what's wrong? And I'm like, I'm having a miscarriage. And they're like, how do you know? And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, are you kidding me right oh now? Oh my like, God. Yeah. Bleeding uncontrollably. I've just been told my baby doesn't have a heartbeat. Like, can somebody see me? Uh-huh. And the first doctor I saw, they did some blood work and he's like, oh, well, you haven't lost that much blood. And I was shocked because I had thought I had lost a huge amount of blood. Right. And then they called in this, uh, an OB to see me. It was in the middle of the night by this point. And the OB came in and she looked at my blood work and she's like, you know, I looked at it and I compared it to your eight week prenatal blood work. And she's like, you've lost an exceptionally high volume of blood. In the end, I had lost about half my blood volume. Oh my God. And I, it was, she said, you've undergone severe trauma. Mm -hmm. And all I kept thinking at the time is how does nobody talk about this? Right. How, How does nobody, like I had a number of friends that had had a miscarriage and I had no idea what physically happened to them. Mm -hmm. It's so true. To me, that that was the biggest thing. I'm like, how do do I not know what to expect? Mm -hmm. So during that night, I remember like Greg was reading on his phone statistics and just understanding how frequent this was and how common this was. And, And I'm like, how can this be common and no one talk about it Mm -hmm. when I just had undergone this severe trauma? So 
that was our introduction into this fertility, infertility world was this first miscarriage. Yeah. And after that, it took me quite a while for my body to bounce back because I was anemic. I was very weak. I just, cause I had had so much trauma on my body from Uh this miscarriage, but we did eventually within you know, it feels like forever, but probably, you know, one cycle started trying again. And I thought for sure, I'm going to get pregnant again right away. And that first cycle, my cycle was late and I'm like, oh, wow, we're incredibly fertile. I'm, I'm pregnant again right away. Right, right, and right. I, did, I must have done 15 pregnancy tests and they were oh all negative. God. And I'm like, well, why are they negative? I don't have a period. I must be pregnant. And, but I wasn't. Mm-hmm. And uh, my doctor had said to me, you know, let's, try for six months. And I'm like, no, I'm too old. I'm not waiting six right. months. Totally. And I made her a deal that we would use my 42nd birthday as our time frame, And uh-huh. that was about four and a half months after the miscarriage. And so she's like, okay, we'll use your 42nd birthday. If you're not pregnant by then, then we'll do something else. Mm -hmm. So uh, conveniently my period started on my 42nd birthday and I called her and I'm like, okay, what's the next step? So she referred me to a reproductive endocrinologist and they started with all the, all the standard tests. I did the HSG to just, that's when they put the dye through your fallopian tubes to make sure everything's not blocked. Uh, That was an interesting test because the first one they discovered, well, initially they thought that I had an abnormal shaped uterus. Mm -hmm. So I remember it being about two weeks of just total hell. And I thought, well, this is what caused the miscarriage is I've got this bad uterus. And Mm -hmm. they sent me for an MRI and they're like, oh no, your uterus is fine. It was just the image that we saw in the x-ray. So like, it was just the number of things that stress you out during this time that don't need to happen. Right. But fast forward, we ended up at this reproductive endocrinologist. And I remember sitting in his office and they did just a standard semen analysis on Greg. And my FSH, my follicle stimulating hormone was Mm -hmm. 9.2, which is not horrible for my Mm -hmm. age, but my AMH was 0.44. So I had a diminished ovarian reserve, but no one one really explained that to me at the time. Uh No one also ever mentioned the words egg quality to me. And at my age, that should have been the number one thing that people talk to me about. It's crazy that they weren't talking about that. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So this, the first RE that we saw, he's like, oh, well, we're going to do IUI with you. And he's like, yep, your numbers don't look too bad. Uh, We'll get you pregnant. And I still remember that appointment. That was the only time we saw that doctor because he Uh turned us over to the nurse practitioners. And then we never saw the doctor. He ghosted you. Yeah. He totally ghosted us, but the nurse practitioners were wonderful. We did one IUI and I still remember um, the first IUI. The nurse looks at Greg and she's like, the sample looks really good. Mm-hmm. And we're like, what does that mean? Like, we, we don't know anything. What does this mean? And she's like, yeah, you know, with the swimmers, once we clean them up, um, we hope that there's 1 million left and you've got 23 million. So mm-hmm. we should, we should be good here. She's mm-hmm. like, and, and they had put me on letrozole and I had two follicles. So she's like, you guys have a really high probabilities of, of having twins. Mm-hmm. So we're like, well, this is going to work. Like, this is all we needed was a little bit of help. We've got all these, these swimmers. We've got these two follicles. Like, bam, we're having twins. Uh-huh. So I was convinced that first one was going to work. Right. And it it didn't. Although looking back on it, it was the the one time I was pregnant. Well, that of any time I've been pregnant, I felt the implantation or what I felt thought oh, was implantation. Like I felt mm-hmm. this really sharp, um, this really sharp jab. And I'm like, I, I think that was implantation. Um, however, they said based on my beta HCG, I wasn't pregnant. So I somehow suspect that I may have had a chemical pregnancy mm. with that one, but mm-hmm. no one ever said that just because yeah. it probably was very apparent and they just wanted to move on. So I, I, I questioned that first one. Um, But we immediately went to a second IUI after that, and they upped my dose of letrozole, and I ended up pregnant the second IUI. Okay. So there we go. Were you feeling pretty confident about that pregnancy then? Very confident because the first one was just bad luck. 
Right. It was, you know, there's nothing wrong with me. It was just bad luck. And now I'm going to get pregnant and everything's going to be, this is going to be great. Mm -hmm. So we had the first um, ultrasound and baby had a strong heartbeat. Everything looked great. We graduated from the fertility clinic. And then I went to see an OB, not my OB, because she was on vacation. So I saw another OB, which was a horrible experience. Mm. But I told Greg he didn't need to come because we had just had the heartbeat the week before. And this was really just a, let's just check this off the list. I just made an OB appointment to get in and everything's going to be great. And I went into that OB appointment and the, the doctor did an ultrasound and she was quiet. So I instantly was worried. And her words to me haunt me still. She's like, I'm having a hard time finding a pregnancy. And mm-hmm. I'm like, what? She's like, I don't see a pregnancy. I'm yeah. Like, what what do you mean by that? Like, right. She's like, I I I'm not, she's like, I need to go get help. I'm not seeing anything. Oh and God. it was very interesting. Like it, it wasn't even just that, because I mean, there wasn't, I saw it. There was an amniotic sac. There was like we had a heartbeat the week before. Right. And she's not able to see anything. So, and she didn't have the screen turned towards me. So I, you know, somehow still suspect she didn't know what she was doing. Right. But anyway, they, they, another doctor came in and she's like, do you want to look to, and I'm like, yes. So she turned the screen towards me and she did this ultrasound and they did, I mean, she found the baby instantly, but there was no heartbeat. So that just kind of hit home to me that yeah. this is this is going to be something's going on and something yeah. bigger is going on and and you know who's going to help me so one thing i didn't mention is when we first went to the re we were at a big hospital and they said to us at the time they're like you should really get on the ivf waiting list mm-hmm. and i said no we're not going to do ivf it's really expensive we don't have any insurance coverage for ivf so I, we're not going to go that route mm-hmm. and the nurse is like if I could give you a little bit of advice, just get on the waiting list. Right. Like, even if you never use it, just Mm -hmm. get on the waiting list. Mm -hmm. So we did. And while I was pregnant with that first, that second IUI, I got a call that we were at the top of the waiting list and I'm like, oh, I'm pregnant. I don't need it, but thanks. Uh And so then immediately when we found out there was no heartbeat on the baby, I called the nurse practitioner and I'm like, do I have to wait again? Or can you get me in? Right. So I ended up, I was actually in my OB's office the a couple of days later after they had found no heartbeat and I was able to get in to see my OB and I just wanted to see somebody that I trusted and that mm-hmm. I knew and the phone rang and I'm like, oh, it's the RE clinic. And she's like, answer it. I want to know what they say. Yeah. <laughs> so I, they said they could get me in the next day. And I remember thinking, I'm like, I can't go to an appointment tomorrow. I'm having a miscarriage oh because God. I was in, I was in my, uh, my OB's office to get the medication to help mm-hmm. start a miscarriage. And after having such a traumatic experience from the first miscarriage, I'm like, I can't do anything. And she's like, no, 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 you can wait a day to take the medicine. Like, just, I want you to go to this appointment. I don't want you to, to wait any longer. So I was very grateful that that unfolded the way it did. Mm -hmm. So I ended up going to this first appointment for IVF and they, the doctor explained to me, you know, given my situation, egg quality was the biggest issue. And given the history of the miscarriages and my age and all of my numbers that I had probably 95% or greater probability of having another miscarriage. And the only way forward would be IVF with PGS testing to test test the genetics of the embryo. Mm -hmm. So that was a very important conversation. So I had started the IVF journey and I still hadn't actually had this second miscarriage yet. And then um, ended up taking the medicine the next day. And the second miscarriage was vastly different to the first. Um, I was Mm -hmm. about eight and a half weeks along, maybe close to nine weeks. I think not actually nine weeks, one day with Uh the second one, which is quite a bit different than almost 12 weeks. Right. Um, So the the baby was a lot smaller. Um, it was not as traumatic. I did not lose as much blood the second time, but yeah. I, you know, emotionally was prepared for it to be as bad as the first one was again. Right. And it's so, good to note just in your story, just now that you said, like yeah. people should know, like you can ask for 
appointments, like the fact that you're like, can I get bumped back up to the top of that list? You know, like you have to advocate for yourself in small and big ways. So I'm glad that you mentioned that. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm glad that I did it because I, who knows how long I would have been waiting otherwise. So, and and at the time I, I thought I needed to stay at this hospital because that's where we started. And I thought Mm -hmm. that's what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. So, and I just assumed that private clinics would be more expensive than the hospital, which is actually Mm -hmm. not the case, but um, I was just trying to navigate it all and not knowing a lot at the time. Mm -hmm. So we started IVF. Well, that was the start of the wait. So it, that was four month wait to get that first consult appointment. Okay. And then this was June and I was able to get on the calendar to do an IVF cycle in October. Uh So in the end, I waited from February to October to get in for our first IVF cycle, which is a really long wait Mm -hmm. um, when you are 42 years old. Absolutely. (laughs) Anytime, but you know, it just, I felt like we were losing time. So anyway, fast, fast forward, we started IVF. We did the first cycle. It was, let's open the textbook. How do you do IVF? This is your protocol. These are your drugs. Here you Mm -hmm. go. Take all these drugs, pay all this money off you go. Mm -hmm. And I had gone to a number of monitoring appointments. And then I got to day nine of my stim cycle. And the doctor said to me, again, it wasn't my doctor. It just happened to be the doctor that was in that day when I went in for monitoring, because that's how it worked at the first place we were at. Mm -hmm. She's like, were you on estrogen priming? And I said, no, they gave me birth control before I started the cycle. She's like, yeah, that didn't work for you. We need to put you on estrogen. Mm. Um, She's like, has anybody talked to you about canceling the cycle? And I'm like, excuse me? Oh my God. And she's like, yeah, this isn't working for you. I think we need to just cancel and start again. And I'm like, what what does this mean? Like, what does that mean financially? What does it like, what does it mean for my body? And she's like, well, you haven't spent that much money yet. She's like, we haven't done a retrieval. And I'm like, I have just pumped $7,000 worth of medication into my body. Like, don't you tell me I haven't spent that much money. Oh my God, yes. Like, it was just so nonchalant. And she's like, well, let me conference with the other doctors this afternoon and we'll call you and let you know what we decide. So day nine of stim cycle, I get a phone call and they're like, yeah, the doctor's conference and they've decided they want to move you to an IUI instead of doing an IVF. And I'm like, what? Oh I'm like, God. I've been told I have a 90, 95% chance of having another miscarriage. Mm-hmm. I'm like, you telling me you want me to do IUI is essentially you telling me you want me to have a miscarriage. Wow. I'm like, no, no, no. That's not what we Did you say like, that? That's exactly what I'm like, I said. Like, fuck yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, they're like, no, 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 we, did, we didn't realize that. And I'm like, you have my chart right in front of you. And for you to give me that advice after looking at my chart means you have not paid attention to who I am as a patient. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I am not okay with this. Yeah. And I demanded to speak to the doctor and I told the doctor exactly that as well. So I felt kind of bad for saying that to the nurse first because she, it was just the poor girl who had to phone me. Like she had nothing to do with the decision, but yeah, I, it yeah. was just, it was on the list of things that frustrated me with that first place we were. Mm -hmm. Um, If you're keeping track, long waiting list, not paying attention. (laughs) Right. Um, So then we went into a next cycle immediately after that. So I started my very first stim cycle on October 14th, 2019. That was my first stim cycle. So by November, we started the next stim cycle. I primed with estrogen and it worked a lot better for me. My my follicles responded a lot better. With a diminished ovarian reserve, you will never get very many follicles and you won't get very many eggs. Um, but when we got to retrieval, I had five follicles. So mm-hmm. we ended up with five mature eggs but only one of them fertilized. So we were left growing one embryo. And I, I mean, you do IVF, it works. That's what you think when you're at this stage. Absolutely. So I'm like putting all of our, literally all of our eggs in one basket and focusing on this one embryo. And we got to day five and the doctor called and said, you know, we're going to keep monitoring it one more day to see if it grows, but so far it's not formed a blastocyst. Mm -hmm. So we get to day six and she calls and she's like, sorry, you know, it it didn't form a blastocyst and and we should talk about starting another cycle. So at this point, I'm like, we had spent probably $40,000 at this point and had Mm -hmm. nothing, nothing to show for it. And 
I was so frustrated and I didn't know what to do, but I'm like, okay, well, let's, let's plan for another cycle. Um, I started talking to her about protocols and what we can do. And then, you know, on the off side of that, I said to Greg, I'm like, I want to go somewhere else. Like, I just, I want to go to a different clinic. I want to try something else. I want somebody that pays attention to us more. Yeah. And then I got a phone call, which I thought was scheduling my next retrieval. And the nurse said, hi, I'm, I'm scheduling your transfer. And I'm like, you mean my retrieval? And she's like, no, 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 no. We have you on the calendar to have a transfer in January. I'm like, I have nothing to transfer. Oh my God. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, mm-hmm. so it was just the one thing after another that just showed that they weren't paying attention to who I was as a patient. And I'm Completely. like, I'm out. Like, I, I can't do this. This yeah. is not working for me. Yeah. So let me wait, pause in your story and just say, how are you guys doing as a couple? Like, was this taking a toll? Yeah. You know, it's interesting because we actually were doing really well at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, there was the bit of when I wanted to go somewhere else, Greg was like, you know, I don't think we're going to get any different service anywhere else. Mm. But he's like, if you really want to, we can. But Mm -hmm. I felt like throughout all of this, it it really did make us stronger. But ask me this question again in a little bit and we'll get back to it. But at this (laughs) point, I I feel like I feel like we were we were very strong at that point. Yeah. And we still are very strong, but it was it it takes a toll. It really Mm -hmm. does. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I had done my research and I really was looking for some place that had better success with women over 40. Um, and we ended up at CCRM and I, I definitely want to mention that it was CCRM that we went to because there's things that unfolded and that CCRM did that others would not have done. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm really happy that we ended up there. Um, and we met with the doctor and it was night and day, like instantly she let us ask questions. They wanted to do more analysis on Greg. Mm-hmm. She, she talked to us about the best way forward. And she's like, given your age, given your history, it is virtually impossible that we will get a normal, healthy embryo with one more cycle. She's like, we need to go into this prepared to do multiple cycles. And mm-hmm. I just, my heart sunk at this point. I'm right. like, I, I don't know where we're going to find extra money. And now we're talking about doing multiple cycles. Right. It's money. And it's time. It's, it's, money, what's, it's what your body's going to go through emotionally, what you're going to go through. That's really a daunting thing to wrap your head around. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. So she explained to us that they had something that CCRM did that was called early embryo banking. It was something I hadn't heard of before, and I don't know how common it is anywhere else. And honestly, it's only a way of making things cheaper. It's not mm-hmm. something like I've had people say to me, they're like, Oh, I haven't tried that yet. Let me try that. I'm like, no, don't, don't do this unless you need to save money. Okay. But yep. it's a, it's a creative way to save money because when you do IVF, the expensive part is the lab. And when they're growing the embryos to the blastocyst stage, that costs a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So what they do with early embryo banking is you go through a stem cycle, you do a retrieval, and then they fertilize the eggs and then they freeze the embryos on day one. And then you don't grow them to the blastocyst stage until later. So basically you bank embryos on day one, you bank fertilized eggs essentially, and then you grow to embryos all at once at a later stage. Mm -hmm. And that makes it a little bit cheaper. Okay. So that's what we did. Um, We went through three cycles. The plan was to do three cycles back to back. Now, this first cycle we did was in March of 2020. Lovely. And nothing notable (laughs) happened then. Right, right. right When the world was just in a wonderful state. Mm -hmm. So we did that first cycle. Um, Oh, the other thing that the doctor recommended was she said, there's been um, research. And I love, I'm like, I love it that you talk science to me. Like she was talking to us in a way that gave me scientific research backing up what she was saying versus let me open the book. And what do you do for IVF? Right. So she said, given your age, there's been, um, and diminished ovarian reserves. Like there's been some research that shows that a lower dose of medication will actually yield a higher egg quality. Mm -hmm. So she's like, I want to do minimum dose IVF. So I still was on a fair number of, of drugs, but I'll, I'll talk to you in money because that to me tells you it's less. I mm-hmm. went from $7,500 worth of medication to $3,000 worth okay. of medication. Yep. So it, it was significantly less medication, but it still was a fair amount. And with that, the second, the next retrieval, we had five eggs, all mature, 
and one fertilized. Mm -hmm. So it was the exact same outcome as we did from our very first cycle. Yeah. But at that stage, she's like, okay, something's going on with fertilization. We need to dive into this a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So Greg had done a DNA fragmentation uh, test as well. And his fragmentation wasn't that bad, but she's like, we may want to try using Pixie. So Mm -hmm. that's physiological ICSI. ICSI is intracytoplasmic sperm injection. So with Pixie, they essentially will in- check the morphology of the sperm before they select it. So they mm-hmm. basically are s- selecting the cream of the crop. So she's like, I- I'd like to do Pixie with you. Um, it was a little bit more money, but at this point, who cares? Like mm-hmm. we're, money doesn't exist at this point. Let's just do this. <laughs> and I kind of took myself at this point to anywhere I could find information. And I found a CCRM support group on Facebook. And I asked if anybody had had issues with with fertilization and what they had done. And a number of people talked to me about something called a calcium ionophore, Mm -hmm. which was a solution for oocyte activation. So it's nothing I do, nothing I take. It basically is when they are fertilizing the eggs, they put this calcium ionophore in the solution. So I had done some research as well, and I found some scientific papers that talked about how this helped with oocyte activation in poor quality eggs. Mm -hmm. So I sent the scientific papers over to my doctor and I'm like, is this something we could do? And she's like, we make you sign a waiver because it may destroy your cycle, but yes, if you want to try it, we can try it. Mm -hmm. So we did that as well. So then we went in on March 15th, 2020 to start my next cycle And I had started priming with estrogen for my next cycle. And at that was the point where the world shut down and all IVF had come to a halt. Right. Because I because I was in a cycle, I was allowed to continue. Okay. You so squeaked I, on by. Yeah. I squeaked on by for a minute. Okay. So, so wait, had I, we met at this point? Because this was no. like right before the rally launched. So we were no. probably about to meet. About and to had meet you found community yet. like on Instagram or anything yet? Did you know that one in eight couples struggle with fertility? That's over 7 million people in the United States alone. And the risk of miscarriage, it's more common than breast cancer or diabetes. The challenges of your fertility journey, we don't talk about them enough. We assume that when you're ready to have kids, it will be easy, but that just isn't the case for everyone. The journey can be expensive, mystifying, and full of disappointment and shame, but there is hope. You are not alone. On the new podcast, Baby or Bust, hosts Dr. Laura Shaheen, an OBGYN and reproductive endocrinologist, answers your questions, dispels the myths, and transforms disappointment into hope. Every episode of Baby or Bust features interviews with experts and real-life infertility survivors to explore answers to questions like, should I put my hips up afterwards? Should I be eating a pineapple to help with embryo implantation? Boxers versus briefs? When do you know it's the right time to have a baby? Will plastics and toxins kill my eggs? What really causes a miscarriage? Do hot tubs really kill sperm? And how do queer people have kids? Join Dr. Shaheen each week for practical approaches for your fertility journey. You are not alone, really. Find Baby or Bust on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Not yeah, a little bit, but not really. Okay. So I guess one thing I, okay, time out. One thing I forgot to mention. So after, and I'm glad you brought that up. After we moved from the first clinic to the second clinic, after the two miscarriages, the two IUIs and the two IVFs that yielded nothing, I got fed up and needed to do something. So mm-hmm. that's when I wrote a book. So mm-hmm. I wrote this book and it's called Prequel to Parenthood that really is all about raising awareness about infertility, recurrent pregnancy loss, miscarriage, and helping people through infertility. Right. Um, And for me, it was really important for me to write it in the middle of the worst part. Okay. Because I found so many times with podcasts and stories and books, you always got the outcome. No one ever talked to you in the middle of hell. Yeah. So for me, it was really important for me to tell this story without anybody knowing what the outcome was. Right. You didn't really have an ending yet. It was like you were in the thick of it. 
Yeah. And I really felt like that gave some hope that, you know, you're not alone. And that Mm -hmm. really is, I I wrote this book to help people going through infertility, but also to give to people that are supporting them. Um, One of the most important things I think in the book is talking about things people say when they think they're helping when they're not. Yes. And it just is, it's a resource to help somebody if you're supporting somebody through. Absolutely. As well too. It's so So, interesting that you were able to do that while you were in the thick of it. Cause I couldn't process it while I was in like the shit I needed to like, I think it helped me process it. Yeah. I can see where I I think it's just two different ways of going about it. Like I couldn't, I was so traumatized by everything I went through. I wasn't able to like touch it with a 10 foot pole for like a year and a half. Like I couldn't even like go back there. I was like, yeah. No, so, for sure. But so just so everybody yeah. knows, prequel to parenthood and infertility story by May Claire Smith. Check it out. I'll put the link in the show notes too. Awesome. Thank you. But yeah, First. so the book was released on March 15th. Mm-hmm. So it was right at the same time that my book came out. Um, I, when my book came out is when I first reach out to you and mm. I'm like, hi, I'd like to meet you. This is right. who I am. This is my story. So all of that was happening at once. I was going okay. in for this next cycle. My book was released and I reached out to you yeah. kind of all at the same time. Okay. I'd kind of forgotten that it all happened on the same day, but it did. Wow. Um, so when I went in for my baseline for that next cycle, I had a cyst on my ovaries and I'm like, oh, it's okay. I've been here before in my other two cycles I did. Um, I had a cyst and uh, that I knew as long as it wasn't producing hormones, I would be okay to move forward. So I'm like, it's okay. Take my hormone levels. We'll, we're going, we're going like, I'm not getting into this COVID shutdown. We are doing this. Like, mm-hmm. Let's get this show on the road. And the nurse called that afternoon and she's like, your estrogen's too high. We can't do this. We have mm-hmm. to cancel your cycle. And I'm like, what do you mean too high? And she's like, well, we'd like it to be under 50 and yours is 900. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, so I want to keep going. And she's like, we can't, we cannot put you in a stim cycle with your estrogen that high. And I'm like, damn it. <laughs> so I got stuck in the delay with everyone else when the world shut down. Mm-hmm. So here we are losing precious time. I'm now 43 and nothing is happening. So I emailed my doctor every single week. And I'm like, can I start yet? Can I start yet? Can I start yet? And Mm -hmm. she's like, no, not yet. We're still, the ASRM is not letting us start. So it was the ASRM, which kind of governs a lot of the recommendations had said that they didn't want any IVF happening during the beginning of the pandemic. Right. So uh, eventually it was at the end of May, middle of May. um, She said, we are just starting a few people. So I want to start with you. And it was the one time my age was ever on my side. And it was because I was old that Mm -hmm. I got to be one of the few first few people. And I still remember going to the fertility clinic those days, those days when there was one nurse working, there was one person at the front desk and there was one doctor there. Like it was a ghost town. Right. Completely. Clinic. So I had like very few patients that they were seeing. So Mm -hmm. I went in, I did that cycle that cycle, we got four eggs, all mature, and all four of them fertilized mm. once we used Pixie and this calcium ionophore. And the okay. doctor's like, okay, I feel like we're getting somewhere now. Figuring like, it out. Should, yep. Yeah. We, we know what we need to do. She's like, okay, let's go. Let's go straight into the next cycle. So I go for my baseline ultrasound for my next cycle, and I have nine cysts on my ovaries. Oh my God. And she's like, they were worried about ovarian torsion. She's like, you can't do anything like stop exercising. Don't do like, I need you to rest. And I'm like, does this mean I can't do a stem cycle? She's like, oh my God, like, no, we cannot do a stem cycle. Right. These, these, over, these, um, your ovaries to go down, the cysts to go down and your ovaries to be okay. So it took, I think three months, um, before I was allowed to start another stem cycle, stem cycle in between those two cycles is when the rally launched and when you and I really got to know each other. Yes. Um, Because I remember by the time I went into that fifth cycle, the third with CCRM, I felt so supported and had this community of people that I didn't know existed. So that to me was really a shining light in all of it. And that third cycle, that last cycle, um, the fifth one, we got three eggs, all mature, all fertilized. Mm -hmm. So we ended up with eight early embryos, Mm -hmm. um, one from the first, four from the second, and three from the 
third. Mm -hmm. So third was CCRM, fifth total. Okay. And they grew those to blastocysts. We ended up with three blastocysts and they were all very high quality. So this is a beauty pageant from what I've learned, but <laughs> they, they were all like AA high quality mm -hmm. embryos. Mm -hmm. So I was very hopeful. Um, they sent them off for PGS testing or CCRM actually calls it CCS testing, which is comprehensive chromosomal testing, but it essentially does the same thing. It just re looks at all the chromosomes uh -huh. and they came, came back and all three of them were genetically abnormal. They all had um, extra chromosomes. Yeah. Oh, so crushing. I was devastated yeah. at that point because yeah. we've done five cycles. We've spent all this money and we've got nothing. It's, and I just, I was devastated. I yeah. was absolutely just, just gutted at this point. So I started at that point earlier on, actually, my doctor had said to me, she's like, I really think you guys should consider using an egg donor. And I'm like, no, I don't want to use an egg donor. I'm not there. I, I don't want to do it. So by this point, we kind of got to the point that I'm like, okay, I'm willing to explore it. And I was looking for more economical ways of using an egg donor, mm -hmm. um, which took us to other countries. So yep. we had looked at um, a couple of clinics in Europe and actually had a few appointments with one clinic um, in Central Europe. Uh -huh. And I was pretty sure we were going to go that route at one point. Um, I had had a few two phone appointments with them. And then Greg and I had a video appointment with the doctor and I was 90% convinced at that point that we were getting on a plane, we were going. And I remember saying, I'm like, but we can't come right now because it's COVID and, and they won't let us travel. And she's like, no, 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 we can give you a, a doctor's note and they'll let you in the country. They're like, we actually had somebody here from California this week, so we can mm -hmm. get you in the country for medical treatment. So I was pretty sure that we were going to go this route. And we had this appointment. And as soon as we got on the call, uh, the doctor and the nurse started talking to each other in a language we did not understand. Mm -hmm. And it, something just fell off. And then they immediately said to us, they're like, well, we're not too happy with the sperm results. And we're like, oh, interesting. No one's really said that to us before. I'm like, well, can you use Pixie? We used Pixie at our other clinic and we got 100% fertilization. And they're like, yeah, we can, but we don't want to use this sperm. We think you should use a sperm donor. And like, we were taken back by this because we're like, that's never been part of the conversation ever. Mm -hmm. And they're like, yes. And I, you know, one thing I didn't mention is my husband and I are a biracial couple. My husband's mm -hmm. black and I'm white. Mm -hmm. And they said, yeah, we think you should use a sperm donor, but all of our donors are white. And mm -hmm. it, just didn't sit well with me. Like yeah. it was almost like as soon as they met us, they didn't want to work with us. Oh my God. And ugh, I might be reading into that, but it just didn't. They were all gung ho with both Greg and I, with us using an egg donor and Greg stuff until they met us. Yeah. So like there was just something just didn't sit well with me. Um, yeah. Which was crushing because uh, for me, I thought that was the way we were going to go. And I I'd kind of made this, it, I'd really built it up in my mind too, of this, you know, just fantasy almost of we could take our children back to Europe and be like, this is where you came from. Right. I just had this really, I don't know, like I, I felt really excited about going down that path. Mm -hmm. So once we kind of ruled that out, we looked into embryo adoption. We looked into uh, other ways of using both male and female donors and then I went back to our doctor and I'm like, do you think we can do this with Greg? And she's like, absolutely. There's no reason why we couldn't because oh, wow. we got hundred percent fertilization. There's no reason why you shouldn't be thinking about that. So I'm like, okay, the, the, these other options just need to go away. Mm -hmm. So Greg and I had talked and I'm like, you know, what do you want to do? And he's like, I'm not ready to stop yet. And I'm like, neither am I. So we decided we wanted to do one more cycle. So we had gone into this saying we were going to do the five. And after five, that was it. Mm -hmm. And we, I guess one thing I didn't talk about is when we moved over to CCRM, I had done a lot myself health-wise. So I had cut out anything that caused inflammation. So mm -hmm. no sugar, no dairy, no gluten. 
I'm already a vegetarian. Um, and then I started intermittent fasting and I mm-hmm. did a lot of research on fasting for fertility and really with the goal of just eliminating all inflammation and anything mm-hmm. I can do. So I felt like we were gaining traction, both with understanding to do Pixie and then anything I was doing. So we really wanted to do one more cycle just to try. So the doctor recommended that we did a combined cycle where we did put me through a stim cycle, Mm -hmm. retrieved my eggs, plus did a lot of donor eggs, put them together, fertilize and grow them together. Yep. So that's what we ended up doing. That stim cycle, which my very last day of stim was February 14th, 2020. Uh So I stimmed exactly one year within from February, from October 14th, 2019 to October 14th, 2020, I did six stim cycles. It's wild. It was just crazy that it ended up that way. Yes, it is. So we did this last stim cycle. We got three eggs, all mature, um, all fertilized. So I am amazing at getting mature eggs Mm -hmm. and we are amazing at fertilizing eggs. I'm not great at getting embryos, but with that, we were able to get, and then we had a lot of donor eggs and 100% of our donor eggs fertilized as well. Mm -hmm. So clearly there was nothing wrong with the sperm. So we grew all of those um, to blastocysts. We ended up with one blastocyst from my eggs and three blastocysts from the donor eggs. Uh Uh-huh sent those away for testing. And it came back that my beautiful five, five AA perfect, beautiful embryo was genetically abnormal. And the donor egg embryos that we had were day seven, mm-hmm. which most fertility clinics stop growing embryos at day six. Yes. Wait, let's, okay. So I really want to talk about this Yeah. Um, this because I haven't really covered this much. And I know yeah. this is really important to you as well. So yeah. tell me about day seven, what you knew about day seven and what the common thing is, the common yeah. notion or the common thinking about day seven embryos. Yeah. So most blastocysts, they like to form in five days Mm -hmm. and they call them a day five blastocyst or a day five embryo. Some clinics, most clinics will grow them to day six. Um, Day six have a slightly higher probability of success. Mm -hmm. I don't know very many clinics that will grow to day seven. Our first clinic threw anything away that didn't grow by day six. So these embryos that we have would have been thrown away at many clinics. Um, right. So why did your, did why did CCRM yeah. do it differently? Do you, do you know, is that just their policy? I, it's just their policy. It's just something okay. they do. Um, yeah. But the doctor did say to us that it was about a 30% probability of leading to a live birth. Mm-hmm. So she's like, we, but we have three of them. So she's like, within the three, I'm hopeful that we may get a baby. Mm-hmm. Um, but these three were all day seven, poor quality embryos. So my beautiful embryos that win the beauty pageant were Mm -hmm. genetically abnormal, but these embryos that were very poor quality by aesthetics were all genetically normal. So Mm -hmm. it's really interesting how they, these gradings that people focus on so much really don't mean anything. It is so interesting. it really comes down to, is this a healthy embryo? Uh So when at that point we're like, okay, well, we've got these embryos. And I I didn't really know too much about day seven at that point, other than it was a low probability, but I don't care. I finally got a good embryo. Mm -hmm. Let's get this show on the road. Yeah. So at at that point, I mean, we'd now been in this, we did IVF for an entire year and I had never done a transfer because I never had anything to transfer. Yeah. So we are getting ready to go into our first transfer cycle. And the doctor said to us, I really want to do a few tests on you. I want to do an ERA. I want to do a receptiva DX. Yep. So basically to understand the environment. Mm -hmm. And I said to her at that point, because I was very impatient, I'm like, well, we got three embryos. Can't we just try? And if it doesn't work, then, you know, we just wasted one, but that's okay. Yeah. And she's like, "If, if you had day five embryos, I would. The fact that you have day seven embryos, I won't, because if it doesn't work, we won't know if it was the embryo or if it was the environment, mm. Okay, because there's a higher probability that this embryo, there's a very low probability that this embryo won't implant because it's a day seven low quality embryo. Okay. So because of that, I want to do all these tests. So I'm like, okay. So she does these tests and the Decept- Receptiva DX showed that I had markers for endometriosis. 
uh, excuse me, what? What, what? Oh my God. You're just finding this out then. (laughs) What is this word you're telling me that has never been spoken to me before? Right. I've, I've never had any symptoms of endometriosis. I, no one's ever talked to me about endometriosis before, but she said, it's very likely that I did have some endometriosis. Um, It's possible that it, grew from the amount of estrogen that I had been on. Mm. So I did six cycles, but I primed three times Mm -hmm. that I didn't get to do a cycle because of um, having extra cysts. So there was a lot of estrogen in my body for a long time. So it's Mm -hmm. possible that that may have contributed to any little bits of endometriosis that may have been there. Right. So they, she said, you can either go in for laparoscopic surgery, or we could put you on this course of Lupron Depot and put you in a forced state of menopause temporarily to try and clear up anything. And then we'll do a transfer. So I did that. Um, It was expensive because the needles, which you get once a month are $1,600 each. But again, by this point, are we keeping track? I mean, Um, once you hit like a the certain marker you're like I know. what's another 10,000 <laughs> exactly what 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 is it at this point let's it's, just just yeah. keep going so um i did and i have been on a pretty much every fertility drug i have been on through one stim cycle or the other mm-hmm. and in the end this depolupron was the devil to me like it was the other ones i could take anything and they didn't have too much of an impact on me this depolupron was horrible mm-hmm. like I'm talking sitting under my desk, bawling my eyes out in the middle of the day because something went wrong. Like I just, I can't, I couldn't turn the light on and I start crying like temper tantrums. Like, oh my God, I just was, this, this was rough on me. So anyway, so we get to, we do this, get through the two months, go in for my baseline and everything looks great. And we get to get ready for a transfer. So I started my first transfer protocol And I got to my transfer and everything looked wonderful. And we were just a little concerned because it was this poor, low quality embryo, but let's give it a shot. Yep. You're day seven. (laughs) Day day seven. So we go in with our little day seven embryo and I do my transfer and they check my progesterone on the day of the transfer. And she's like, eh it's a little low. So let's get you back in 48 hours just to make sure your progesterone doesn't go down. Mm -hmm. And I went back and my progesterone went down and I'm like, great. So this is clearly not working. Um, So they increased my dose of progesterone, brought me back in a couple of days. Progesterone was going up nicely, went back for my beta HCG pregnancy test. And at this point I had pretty convinced myself that it hadn't worked. And I'm like, was just moving on already and calculating dates of when we could do the next transfer. Right. And for a pregnancy test, the beta HCG, if it's over 20, it's considered positive. Mm -hmm. They explained it to us that they'd like it to be over 50 if they know it's a viable pregnancy. Mm -hmm. My beta was 36. Okay. So the doctor was like, or the nurse, the doctor didn't call, the nurse called. And usually when you're pregnant, the doctor calls. Yeah. So the nurse called and she's like, so technically you're pregnant. But yeah. we're not sure it's viable. So oh we need God. you to come back in 24, 48 hours. Oh, that's so such a went, <laughs> fucking terrible wait. It was horrible. It was horrible. It was the worst day ever. So I went back in 48 hours and she said to me, she's like, we need it to be at least a hundred when you come back. And I'm like, I thought it needed to double. She's like, yes. And I'm like, 36 times two is 72. It's mm-hmm. not a hundred. Right. So I went back and it was 77. Uh-huh. So she's like, okay, it's doubled, but oh it's my still God, really low. this little embryo's so, fighting so hard. <laughs> the little embryo that could. Totally. And she's like, she's like, we want you to come back again just to make sure it keeps increasing. So I went back again in 48 hours and it had gone from 36 to 77 to 222. So I'm like, okay. So she's like, okay, it looks like you're pregnant. However, it's still statistically really low. So we want you to come back for one more beta. So I went for one more beta and it went up to like 500 and some. And she's like, so at this point, we would expect your beta to be over 2000 and yours is 500. So she's like, let's not get our hopes up, um, but we'll bring you back in two weeks for an ultrasound. But 
it's not looking great. Mm -hmm. So this is hell. Like this is just a horrible time period in this Mm -hmm. time. So Mm -hmm. I go in for my first ultrasound and the doctor's like, okay, she crosses her fingers and she's like, you know, let's see what we see, but it's really early. I'm basically just looking for a fetal pull. It's too early. We probably won't see a heartbeat, but let's just see if anything is growing. And we went in and there was a little heartbeat. Oh my God. And we're like, he exists. <laughs> yes. He's there. But you're still probably scared shitless, right? Totally scared. Totally mm-hmm. scared. Like it was just was like, I remember, and Greg couldn't go to any of these appointments with me because of COVID. They wouldn't let him in. Mm-hmm. So two weeks later, I went back for another ultrasound and I remember bawling my eyes out, like shaking, leaving the house to go to that appointment. Mm-hmm. And Greg's like, what are you worried about? And I'm like, cause everything goes, something's going to go wrong. Like right. everything goes wrong. Yep. So I was terrified and I got there and nope, he had grown and he was, the heartbeat was strong and everything looked good. And they graduated me from the fertility clinic. I'm like, are you sure? Like, are you sure you don't want to see me every week here just to do another ultrasound and just right. going with me? Totally. Like, I'm pretty, I'm pretty, I'm like, I've been here every single day for the last year and a half. Like, I'm yeah. pretty sure you don't want me to leave, but yeah, they graduated me. And I eventually went to my OB, which was triggering as well, because I, that first appointment after graduating is when bad things have happened before. So I was a little anxious, but Sure enough, he just kept growing. And I I still remember going in, I think for the 16 week appointment Mm -hmm. and I'm like, where's the ultrasound machine? And she's like, oh, we don't do an ultrasound at 16 weeks. I'm like, yes, you do. (laughs) Hell yeah, you do. (laughs) Like, I'm like, my doctor told me I could have an ultrasound whenever I want one. I want one. Go get Mm -hmm. it. (laughs) Mm-hmm. And she's like, oh, okay. So I demanded a lot. Good for you. It, just like, and the it's interesting because the first 12 weeks obviously were very stressful for me getting past that first landmark mile post of that we where we lost the very first baby. Right. But honestly, 13 to 18, 19 weeks was the worst for me. Why? And it's because I wasn't sick anymore. I couldn't feel anything. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what's going on? Like, you only see the doctor every four or more weeks. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, is there still a baby in there? Like, yeah. I, I, it was, right. It was, did terrifying. you ever think about getting like a Doppler for home or anything like that? <laughs> I got one. Yeah. And, they're just so hard to use and they, especially early on, it's really, really difficult. So I think it it can cause a lot more anxiety. I, the first time I used it, I did find a heartbeat and I'm like, okay, this is great. And then the next time I didn't, I'm like, this is done. I'm never using this again. <laughs> so right, right. I, I used it a little bit, but I think yeah. I only used it two or three times. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was once I felt the baby move for the first time, I felt a lot better. And mm-hmm. then he was incredibly rambunctious and moving around all the time. So right. um, that definitely made me feel better, but I never calmed down. I never calmed down. I was right. anxious and worried the entire time. I I didn't tell work that I was pregnant until I was about six and a half months. Mm-hmm. I just didn't. And I mean, I could get away with it because I was at home and no one sees you on right. Zoom. So exactly. I, yeah, I went through the bulk of my pregnancy with most people not not knowing I was right. pregnant. Yeah. I remember um, talking to you about that and you're saying, I think I'm finally going to tell work and yeah, you know, it's, it was like such a big moment because yeah, it's so scary. And like, so you know, scary. we talk a lot about the anxiety of pregnancy and motherhood too, mm-hmm. after infertility and just always being on the wrong side of the statistics and always waiting for yeah. the other shoe to drop. And, yeah. you know, I think if people haven't heard that already on my show, they need to know, like, it's so common. So if you're going through that right now and feeling really nervous, even if you are pregnant, it's understandable and the fears are valid and the anxiety is valid. And you can always reach out to any of us, Claire, to me to talk about it because it helps to, I think, to talk about it with people. Oh, it definitely helps. It definitely helps. And it just, yeah. So, so we get to 36 weeks and I go to my doctor's appointment and she's like, okay, well, we should plan to induce you around 38, 39 weeks. And I'm like, no, this baby's being born soon. And she's like, I'm like, yeah, I'm thinking he's going to be born by the end of the week. And she's mm-hmm. like, she's like, no, 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 no. You've got a couple weeks left. And I, my water broke the next day and I went into labor and he was born at 36 weeks. Oh my God. So, you know, just, your own body. So wait, I can't remember. Yeah. Did you know the gender? 
We did. Yeah. Okay. We knew we were having a boy. Okay. So that's right. We were pretty excited about it. Oh my God. Um, so right tell me about that start, moment so. when you saw little baby Isaac and he, he was yeah. born. I mean, was it, it, it was after everything you've after been through everything. Oh my goodness. So yeah. So here he's born and I just kind of had this moment of like, is this real? Like, mm-hmm. is it real? Is he really real? And then, you know, in the hospital, it's this, everything's crazy. And he's just, we're like, oh my goodness. And they were doing all these poking and prodding. And he was a little bit jaundiced when he was born. And he was a little bit early, not not too bad, but early enough that they just wanted to monitor him a little bit more. And I actually remember that the the nurse came in and they're like, well, you're fine. Um, but so we're going to not dismiss. What's the word? Um, Evict discharge did thank you discharge they're gonna you say evict, evict. <laughs> eject <laughs> yeah. you got evicted they're like, yeah they're like we're gonna discharge you but we're keeping the baby one more day and i'm like what i'm like i'm not going anywhere i'm like no if you're keeping my baby i'm staying in this hospital room i don't care and <laughs> mm-hmm. they're like oh, like uh, so we did end up staying an extra day mm-hmm. um because it, oh remember this because i'm fine they said these words so fast forward a week and we were getting ready so we're at home first week with a newborn and i'll talk a little bit about postpartum craziness in a minute too but getting ready to go to Isaac's one week appointment and I'm standing in the kitchen holding him and I feel something. And I said to Greg, I'm like, can you hold him for a second? There's something's wrong. And Greg's like, what do you mean something's wrong? And I was wearing a dress and I lifted up my dress and there was blood pouring down my leg. Oh my God. And I'm like, oh my God, what's going on? And I went to the bathroom and like blood just started gushing Mm -hmm. out of me. Mm -hmm. And I had blood clots and like, this is very graphic. I'm sorry, anybody you might want to skip this, but like Mm -hmm. the the toilet filled up with blood Mm -hmm. and I was losing so much blood. I didn't know what to do. I sat on the floor of the shower and blood clots were just like flow coming out of me. It was terrifying. It was terrifying. And I was on the phone with the doctor and they're like, we're transferring you into emergency. We need you to go to the emergency room. Mm -hmm. And so Greg took me to emergency and we get there and they're like, they can't come in they have to go away. And I'm like, he's six days old. Like mm-hmm. you can't take my baby away from me. And they're like, no, they have to leave you. They, cause of COVID we can't have them come in. So I basically got wheeled into the emergency room and Greg took Isaac home. And I was just a mess at that point. And a doctor came in and did an ultrasound and discovered that my uterus was filled with blood clots. Mm -hmm. And they sent me to emergency surgery to have an emergency DNC. And my doctor, my doctor actually ended up being on call. So my own OB was there for it. And she told me that they were pulling out blood clots the size of oranges. Yeah. So this was what they called a delayed postpartum hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. Um, Usually when this happens, it's because of a retained placenta, but that was not the case with me. It was just, hasn't enough happened to me? Like something else has to happen now. Right. Like it just, it's just you like, can't oh, have wait. it easy, May Claire. Come on. No, no. Like, well, it's, we got, we got to, there's got to be something else. So um, I ended up having an emergency DNC. I needed a blood transfusion. I had lost, you know, a huge amount of blood. Yeah. So that was fun. So oh that just kind of added to all of it, but yeah. along with it, like, and then, you know, coming home and, you know, I have an amazing husband and yes. he is so wonderful and so caring and he's been so great with Isaac. But those first few weeks, my hormones mm-hmm. were insane. Yeah. Like it was, I was 10,000% convinced that Greg hated me that I like, he hate, he hated me. Everything he said, I was like, he thinks I'm a horrible mother. Like oh it was, God. I was so convinced that like, I, I'm like, maybe I should have just died when I had the hemorrhage. Like, oh my God. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be here. Like I really, so this is legit here. postpartum. This is, yeah. Right? It was what legit. Is it? it was legit. It only lasted, I think they call it baby blues for the first few weeks. So it didn't, it didn't last mm-hmm. long, but I, I mean, I still have moments of like, Greg says something to me. He's like, maybe we should try this. And I'm like, you think I'm a horrible mother? And Aww. it's like, and he doesn't obviously, but it's like my brain just assumes that right. the worst of everything. 
But, you know, one of the things that has been the most interesting, and again, this was just in the first couple of weeks, but when Isaac was first born, I wasn't convinced he was real. And I know you say this with Sonny all the time too, that you look at him and you're like, I can't believe you're actually here. I say that to a maker every single day. I do. I say, I still can't believe you're here at some point during the day. And he just, now he's like, one of these days he's going to be like, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah. But now he just laughs. He goes, I'm always here. Oh, so cute. So, I know. So cute. But I do so say so that cute. to him yeah. at some point. I don't think I've missed a day. I mean, it could yeah. be even be like, he's like asleep and I'm like, shit, I didn't say it, but I'll say it to him while he's sleeping. <laughs> but I, I think of it but every yeah, day because it was, I, we went I, through, you know, complete hell to have him. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's where I, I feel too. And there, there was a time very early on in the first two weeks, which is where the worst of the hormones were that I had convinced myself that he was my niece, Jessica. And I had called him Jessica. I referred mm-hmm. to him as a girl and I called Greg Sean, which is my brother. Whoa. And I had like, I do not know what was going on. Like it was just total hormones that uh-huh. I had convinced myself that he can't possibly be real, that I'm just taking care of my niece when she was a baby. It was wow. crazy. That's it interesting. Really crazy. It's really crazy. I've actually Did never you ever have to anybody it- about that. Yeah. Have you ever had it like diagnosed or did you talk to a therapist or a doctor or anything about that? You know what? I didn't. And it's interesting because I, I had a really good therapist throughout the whole infertility uh, journey, um, Misconception Coast Coach if on Instagram. If you haven't seen her, she's phenomenal. Jenny, uh-huh. I love her so much. And I really should have talked to her, but I didn't during any of this. And I think it's because when you're in the thick of it, like it's about survival during those first few weeks postpartum Yeah, that it was my survival, Isaac's survival, Greg and my marriage survival. Like there was just, it was so difficult. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, like I didn't ever talk to anybody about, you know, what I was going through or how bad it was. And like, I, I think if any of my friends are listening to this, they'd be like, holy crap, I didn't know that happened. And it's just like, you just don't talk about it. And right. For me, it's like, that's along on the list of miscarriage and infertility and yeah. postpartum. Like you just, nobody talks yeah. about it. Well, I hope that your so friends do listen to this and yeah. then maybe you can have those conversations and <laughs> I know. maybe you'll, you know, be able to help other people and anybody yeah. listening that's going through that knows yeah. that, you know, you're not alone and this is part of the process. And after going through trauma, yeah. Yeah. you know, crazy things happen, not crazy that's in true. a bad way, just wild yeah. Just Un- wild stuff. Yeah. yeah like Insane. things you never thought would happen yeah. happened to you mentally and physically. And this yeah. is a fucking wild ride. It really so. is. So it's interesting because so many people have said to me, they're like, are you, are you going to write another book? And everybody kind of assumes that, you know, I need to finish the prequel to parenthood because the prequel is over and, you know, right. talk about it. And I've kind of gone back and forth. And I, I think for me, the the thing that if I did that I would focus, well, it'd be one of two things. The thing I think I would focus on would be postpartum yeah. and talking about that and, and what happens to your body and just things that, you know, I assumed it was just me. I assumed that, you know, everything anybody said to me was because they thought I wasn't good enough, that they thought, it, and it's something Greg said to me quite recently, and he said it a few times, was he's like, it's not a competition. He's like, yeah. but if it were, we're already winning the race because we have a day seven embryo that is here. And every, like so many clinics would have thrown him in the garbage. They never would have even let him have a chance to grow. And he is the most perfect child on the planet. Right. He could sleep a a little better right Right. now. But he's healthy. But but yeah, he's healthy. He's He's healthy. He's here. He's cute. He's funny. He's smiling. Like he is such a happy baby. And I can't get over the fact that I'm going to say 90% of the clinics around the world would have thrown him in the garbage, would never have given him a chance to survive. And it was only because CCRM has a policy that they let embryos grow to day seven and that they were willing to take a chance on him. And we were willing to take a chance on him, knowing that he had a 30% chance of success, that we've got this perfect little boy. All right. Thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you so much, May Claire. I'm so happy for you guys. And check out Prequel to Parenthood, her book. 
and definitely check out Fertility Rally as well if you guys are looking for community and support. As I've said so many times, we have three support groups a week. We have this badass sisterhood like no other. These women have truly become my family. I'm so passionate about it. We're growing every single month. We're open the first week of every month. So we open up again May 1st and we would love to have you become a member of our fam. Everybody is welcome, no matter where you're at. So uh, reach out to me at Infertile Life Stories on Instagram if you have any questions or you can reach out to Blair and me at Fertility Rally on IG. But we really hope to see you guys. And thank you so much for listening. Talk to you next time. Thank you.